Good morning everyone, this is Dr. Alex Vasquez and today I have a new review for you. I'm going to call this Cardio Nutrition Number 3 since it combines the topics of cardiology, preventive medicine, and of course nutrition. So we're going to call this Cardio Nutrition Number 3 and this is going to be a critique of the recently published article Effects of Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplements in Diabetes Mellitus. This is also described as the ASCEND study. This was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine 2018 in August. So as usual, let's begin by taking a look at the structure and the details of this article. This is a randomized trial involving more than 15,000 subjects. This was started in 2005 and that date is important and I'll point that out as we go through the details here. The intervention here was one capsule per day. Some people also received aspirin but the authors did not discuss the details and one of the interesting characteristics of this article, I'm going to show you some unique characteristics as we go through, but one of them that I want to point out right now is the lack of detail. So for example, they barely mentioned that some of the patients received aspirin, but they didn't describe within the study structure who received aspirin and what the adverse effects were and what the consequences were and how were patients selected to receive aspirin or not receive aspirin. They just said some patients received aspirin, but without a description, First of all, that tells us nothing as the reader. That doesn't tell us what's going on within the study. And second of all, a characteristic of valid research is that it can be tested by an independent researcher and replicated. So uh, another researcher should be able to read this study and try to replicate it to see if these findings are valid. But when the details and the structure of the research is very vague, another researcher couldn't follow the study up and do the same procedure because the procedure isn't described adequately within this study. And I am going to point out, because it was notable in this study, and I, I don't see this very often, but what I did see in this study is they had some basically some gaping holes in their description of the study methodology and a few other gaping holes that are perhaps at least as bad, if not worse. So again, within the structure of this article, subjects received either one capsule per day of fish oil, which provided 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA. So if you followed my work and if you've looked at my other publications and my recent video on this topic, then you know that 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA is less than half of the recommended dose for cardiovascular disease prevention, especially at high risk patients. So again, this is less than one half of the recommended dose. I invite you to take a look at my other video produced earlier this year. The other subjects received a quote-unquote placebo, but it wasn't a placebo. It was olive oil, arguably, well, it's not even arguable. Olive oil is one of the most cardioprotective foodstuffs uh, available through diet or supplementation. So calling olive oil a placebo completely invalidates this entire study. So like we could stop the review right here and say, okay, the study is bogus. We, I mean, of course, we can look at their findings. We can see if we can learn something from it. But in terms of comparing fish oil to a placebo to uh, assess the validity of using fish oil as a treatment for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, this, com this study is completely invalid, completely invalid. Now, again, we can look at it to see if we can learn something. But in terms of learning whether or not fish oil is effective for cardiovascular disease prevention, we're probably not going to find it in this study because their study design was flawed from the very beginning. And in my opinion, that could not have been an accident. Uh, when they started this study in 2005, they clearly had access to information showing that olive oil was cardioprotective. So they bungled their own study. I mean, the study is a complete mistake. It was a waste of their time. It's a waste of the publication. And yet, this study is going to be used even now in 2018 to discredit nutritional supplementation. And that's where the real kind of scientific crime occurs here. This study should not have been conducted from the start. It should not have been published and it shouldn't be praised or used as a citation uh, as if it were providing us with valid information because it's not. So again, olive oil is quite obviously one of the most potent cardioprotective and anti-inflammatory foodstuffs available. It is not a placebo, especially for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, and its use as a comparator invalidates the findings of this study. I'm very clear on that. 
data suggesting health benefit of olive oil, especially a cardioprotective benefit, was available from the original Keys study back in 1966. And this was recently reviewed in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003, which was obviously two years before they even started this study. So the journal could have used its own citation to refute this study, which it then later published 15 years later. I and mean, that's just ridiculous. So in 2013, who published a brief kind of commentary editorial titled Mediterranean Diet and Mortality, Olive Oil and Beyond, in which he discussed the key study, which was started back in the 1950s. And again, they knew that olive oil was cardioprotective, so it has no place being described as a placebo. I mean, that's, that's an intellectual error by itself, let alone using it within a study uh, and then publishing that study as if it were to say something. It, it doesn't say anything other than the fact that these people are either intentionally ignorant or, or just completely clueless. By 1986, the entire cardiology, nutrition, and epidemiology worlds were aware that olive oil was cardioprotective. So again, using, first of all, again, describing olive oil as a placebo for anything is a lie because olive oil is very biologically active and the clinical trials have proven that now for decades. So olive oil can never be used as a placebo in any study. At the very least, we have to call this intentional ignorance. Uh, I would probably describe it also as strategic ignorance or a strategic feigned ignorance. They're trying to pretend that they're ignorant, but they're doing so in a strategic manner. And I'll be very clear on what I think that strategic manner is. And I think a more accurate way to actually describe that, so we can say intentional ignorance. If you want to be mild about it, you can say intentional ignorance. If you want to be a little more clear, in my opinion, you could use a term by Professor Henry Giraud called the violence of organized forgetting. So is bad research a form of violence against people? Well, so what, would, what is violence? Violence is that which hurts people intentionally, right? So if we are hurting people intentionally by publishing bogus research, is that research therefore a form of violence? I think that's an argument that could be made. Whether we call it intentional ignorance or the violence of organized forgetting, I'll leave that to you and move on in this review. So what really happened in this study? Reasonably, we can summarize that both groups received a low or modest dose of cardioprotective intervention. And again, the study is notable for its missing information. Neither of the two treatments were independently tested for their components, and both of the treatments, that is the active fish oil and the so-called, well, I'm not going to describe it as a placebo anymore. I'm just going to say it's olive oil. So they compared fish oil to olive oil, basically. And then when those treatments were more or less equivalent in their effects, they stated that fish oil was ineffective for cardio protection. But what's actually true, what's actually more accurate to state, is that fish oil and olive oil are both cardio protective. And the difference using a low dose intervention like this, which is almost uh, clinically worthless, is that they didn't find a significant difference between those two interventions, both of which, again, are biologic and cardioprotective. So let's look at some of the details now. So the drug company, Mylan, had paid at least 19 of the authors recently, oversaw the study design, and supervised its paid consultants at key meetings. And this is within the study description. I'm not making any of this up. I'll show you the actual documents here in just a moment. So we have a drug company paying the authors of the study. We have a drug company supervising the study research meetings and their paid consultants. The drug company provided the treatment and the, both the fish oil and the olive oil, neither of which were independently tested for their components, which is also suspicious, and I'll explain to you why I'm even more suspicious. And this drug company also makes the main competing drug in this category, which is a statin drug called simvastatin. So before we go on, let's look at the actual study itself and look at a few details. And then I'll summarize those details. I'll look at a little more information and then we'll call it a wrap. So here we're actually gonna take a look at the article itself. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this and obviously I'm not gonna read it word for word, but let's at least go through some of the information. So again, effects of omega-3 fatty acid supplements in diabetes mellitus. This is the so-called ASCEND study, a big collaborative group, as if that sounds 
important. This article was just published uh, August 26, 2018. So let's take a look at the article. They've got more than 15,000 subjects. They either received fish oil or olive oil. Again, olive oil should never be described as a placebo. That's just, that's just ridiculous. Medically and biologically, that's a ridiculous statement. And it's just a lie. It's just not accurate. Uh, again, some of the patients got aspirin, but that was very vaguely described. So again, olive oil is clearly not a placebo since it's anti-inflammatory and cardioprotective, just as are the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. So we have a writing committee here, and unfortunately, these people spent a lot of time in school, and I can't say that their education paid them off very well if this is the level of their performance. These people assume responsibility for the overall integrity, content and integrity of this article. I'm sorry that that's true for them. So this was published out of the University of Oxford, which interestingly enough also published the other fatty acid study this year, Associations of Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement Use with Cardiovascular Disease Risk. I reviewed this earlier this year. This was also published out of Oxford, and this article is a complete disaster. A complete embarrassment to the field of cardiology, the journal JAMA Cardiology, if embarrassment can be uh, bestowed upon such a publication, and clearly an embarrassment to the University of Oxford that they would allow this to be published under their name. So I invite you to take a look at my review of this, but this article is a complete scientific disaster and again came out of University of Oxford. So now let's take a look at the current article again and see where we go from here. So University of Oxford apparently provided some staffing for this, some staffing and structure, I might say, for the publication of this article. Now look, we're, look at where we go from there. Uh, the trial was funded by the British Heart Foundation. So uh, that sounds great. Look, I mean, we've got a study coming out of the University of Oxford. It was funded by the British Heart Foundation. I mean, that sounds so great. It sounds so academic and so clean until we actually look at the details. Capsules containing the omega-3 fatty acids and matching placebo were provided by the drug company Mylan which makes simvastatin, which is the competing drug and probably in the medical world considered one of the drugs of choice for cardiovascular disease treatment and prevention. Another drug company, of course, Bayer provided the aspirin and placebo. So before we go on, I just want to point out, and you can kind of make a mental note of this, let's look at the drug companies Mylan, Bayer, and also Solvay and Abbott. Mylan, Solvay, and Abbott had non-voting representation at meetings of the steering committee of the study and provided comments regarding the trial design and draft manuscript. That's among the most bizarre statements I've ever read in my more than 20 years of looking at research. So, again, in more than 20 years of looking at research, I've never seen a study that had a drug company provide the products that were being studied, also paying most of the authors of the study, and also being allowed to attend the structural meetings of the study design. That's, again, something that occurs to me as among the most bizarre things I've ever read in more than 20 years of looking at biomedicine, that they would have a drug company so well embedded and infiltrated into the study design providing the placebo, providing the active treatment, and attending the meetings and paying many of the authors. That's just exceptional. So let's continue taking a look at this. Again, look at what they state here, that this is coming out of University of Oxford and the British Heart Foundation. You also notice among their affiliations, they don't mention anything about... Uh, affiliations with drug companies. They do mention a little bit of Oxford here, but typically conflicts of interest are published either on the first page or at the end of the article. So let's see if they follow that routine here. Some of the patients were already taking fish oil and they were allowed to continue taking fish oil on top of the treatments in the study. So again, that's fishy if I may say so, even though it's obviously a pun. I think we'd all agree that it's, this is a bit fishy, that they were allowed to take their own independent fish oil supplements in a study supposedly comparing olive oil to fish oil. So that certainly compromises their design. 
Uh, let's look here at what I mentioned previously. Placebo aspirin in placebo aspirin in a separate portion of the trial, but they didn't mention what that what that is. What is the separate portion of a of a trial? Who received aspirin, etc. I was a bit perplexed by that, and I have the right to be confused by this article because this article is confusing. If they don't describe clearly how they conducted the study, then the fault is theirs. The fault is not mine. If I'm reading this and something doesn't make sense, then it's because they perhaps didn't want it to make sense, but this doesn't make sense to me. I have read this article twice and I don't see where they describe that at all. Eligible patients again received 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA or olive oil and some people received aspirin but that was not described. So well, it's a little bit confusing. I'm not too concerned about 100 milligrams of aspirin, but you know, when we're looking at a large study that's looking for small changes and small details, then every detail matters. So perhaps this is relevant. Uh, or what was the placebo? So they gave a placebo without describing what the placebo is. Well, what's the placebo? The pill has to be made out of something. Was it magnesium? Was it lactose? Was it potassium citrate? What was it? What was in this pill that may have affected the results? Again, that data is mysteriously missing. So again, they started this in 2005, as I mentioned previously. The use of over-the-counter fish oil supplement was reported by 10% of patients at baseline. And then some of them had discontinued by the end of some of the follow-up. Not all of the follow-up. So again, that was a bit suspicious. And my question here as I was reading this is obviously, where is the data? So they've got 10% of their patients taking a fish oil supplement on top of the olive oil or fish oil that they're using in the study. And we have no idea what's going on with the aspirin because they didn't include the data. So my question is, where's the data? They did look at the omega-3 index in 152 patients. 152 patients out of 15,000 is 1%, actually less than 1% of the patients. So I don't really know what they can state based on looking at 1% of their population. Also, let's take a look at this. Little change in the percentage among patients in the placebo, in, well, in the olive oil group. So this is consistent with what we would expect, uh, mostly. And what I mean to point out is the fact that their omega-3 index actually reduced a little bit in the olive oil group. We would expect that because the oleic acid would displace some of the EPA and DHA while also providing its own cardioprotective benefit. So, you know, the world does not revolve around the omega-3 index. Other constituents such as oleic acid and especially the polyphenols within olive oil also provide cardioprotective benefit independent of the patient's decreasing or increasing omega-3 index. So this is exactly what we would expect. Now, you'll notice, again, in the olive oil group, they started at 6.6. .6. That's actually a little bit higher than what we would expect. So the typical omega-3 index in, untreated, in an untreated population, just your typical population, is actually in the fives, not in the sixes. So this is actually slightly higher than we might expect. But in the fish oil group, they started at an omega-3 index of 7.1. That's notably higher than average. And also the fact that they went from 7.1 to 9.1 on a low dose fish oil supplement is also a little bit suspect in the sense that it's out of normal. So the fact that they were impressively different from the olive oil group is one thing that I'd like to point out. The olive oil group started out a little bit better than average and the omega-3 group was definitely better than average. And then their change from 7.1 to 9.1 is actually remarkable for such a low dose supplement. So that whole thing looked a little suspicious to me. And that's exactly why in a study like this, what should have been done is independent laboratory analysis of both the active treatment fish oil and also in this case, the other group's treatment, which was the olive oil. Somebody should have looked at that independently to see why this change occurred so impressively. So typically to achieve this level of change would require about 1900 milligrams or almost two grams per day of EPA and DHA. And these patients were receiving less than half of that. And 
I'm was I was pretty impressed by that change. So I'm just curious as to how that happened. And again, they did not provide independent analysis. So my note here in the margin, this is far above the typical values in terms of baseline and response with regard to their omega-3 fatty acid index. And again, they only looked at that in less than 1% of their subjects. So I, I can't state that that's a, a really good methodology. Uh, we also note that about half of the patients were obese and 94% of them were diabetic. Also, 75% of them were already on a statin. So why isn't any of that mentioned here? If we're looking at omega-3 fatty acid supplements in diabetes, we're not simply looking at diabetes. We're also looking at diabetes with obesity and a lot of patients treated already with a statin. So why isn't that mentioned in the title when it was so clearly obvious in their uh, patient selection? So I was a little bit curious about that as well. Oh, let's take a look at this. We're going to start looking at these at these charts here. Sometimes these are called forest plots or whatever. But look at fatty acids were actually better than olive oil in terms of preventing first cardiovascular events. So we definitely see priority here for omega-3 fatty acids. If we look here, things are looking pretty even. But again, that doesn't really... It doesn't mean a lot when we're comparing omega-3 fatty acids with olive oil. Who's to say that one would be better than the other at this low dose when both are already known to be cardioprotective? Discussion. Patients with diabetes and no evidence of cardiovascular disease received a daily regimen of omega-3 fatty acids low dose or low dose olive oil and did not have a significantly lower incidence of serious vascular events than those who received the olive oil. So again, what they're trying to state here is that fish oil provided no benefit. Again, they provided, they again, they studied the fish oil against an active treatment, so it's not really a placebo-controlled study. This is a comparative study. Again, we see some benefit here of the low-dose fish oil. It was low-dose, but obviously not low-potency because they received a, a tremendous increase in their omega-3 fatty acid index. Uh, from what was otherwise described as a low dose. So I suspect that their product was inappropriately labeled. In conclusion, among patients with diabetes, but without evidence of cardiovascular disease at baseline, no significant difference between vas uh, among vascular events between fatty acids and olive oil. Again, their use of the term placebo is completely inaccurate. I mean, that's science. It's, it's linguistically or grammatically we might it's linguistically or grammatically inaccurate and therefore of course even worse it's scientifically and medically inaccurate i mean this is this is the inaccurate this is the inaccurate and inappropriate use of language here this is not a placebo it's active active treatment so bayer provided the aspirin and placebo which were not otherwise described and the drug company solvay abbott and myelin provided the omega-3 fatty acids and the olive oil. So impressive is the observation that those were not independently analyzed. That would have been much more legitimate instead of just taking these products from the drug company that has a vested interest in this study and then saying that everything was okay. That they don't they don't know. And you'll notice that we're at the end of the article here. Affiliations affiliations of the members of the writing committee are as follows. So academics, 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 college, college, Cambridge, Leeds General Infirmary, University Hospital, uh, all in the UK. So where are the other affiliations? So you'll notice, and again, like I said, this is the end of the article. This is the final page. So we see no information at all in this article about disclosures, affiliations with drug companies, anything like that. We don't, we just don't see it. It's, it's not in this article. It's not on the first page. It should have been here on the first page. At the very least, it should have been here at the end of the article. Now they mentioned affiliations here, but why don't they mention all the affiliations? This is very selective information here. So again, this article just made me very suspicious. Supported by grants to the University of Oxford from the British Heart Foundation. So University of Oxford again, strategic partnership, strategic partnership. Yeah, strategic. Uh, that's probably worth under underlining. 
British Heart Foundation, et cetera. So let's look at that uh, strategic partnership. Let's go look at the data on their conflicts of interest. So why wasn't this information included in the study, in the published study as it was? So if we go to the New England Journal of Medicine website, then we get to access these disclosure forms and look at what we find when we access these forms. We find that the authors are paid by Medical Research Council, Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation, Bayer, 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 Bayer Pharmaceuticals again, Solvay Pharmaceuticals, Abbott Pharmaceuticals, and Myelin Pharmaceuticals. Well, that becomes more interesting. Let's see who else, Pfizer and Merck. And here again, British Heart Foundation, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Solvay, Abbott, and Myelin again. Myelin, again, is the company that makes Simvastatin. So here you can see on their official uh, letterhead or their official statement here, Simvastatin, Myelin. So they have this available at 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams, simvastatin, simvastatin throughout. What is this drug used for? It's used in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease with or without existing coronary heart disease. The goal of this drug is to reduce the risk of total mortality by reducing cardiovascular coronary heart disease deaths, major vascular events, major coronary events, stroke, etc. So obviously this drug company, Myelin, has an interest, a commercial interest in this multi-million, multi-billion dollar drug called Simvastatin. And what do you know, they're actually funding many of the researchers who participated in this study. Uh, and again, the structure of the article should have disclosed this and it wasn't disclosed. In this case, I had to go to the New England Journal of Medicine website and look up the information. Again, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, Solvay, Abbott, and Mylan. What, what my point is in repeating this information is to get you to see the pattern here. What you're going to see here is a pattern, obviously, that all of these researchers who disclosed financial arrangements with drug companies, they all have the exact same pattern of financial agreements. Medical Research Council, Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation, Bayer, 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 Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. So that's the third at least time that we've seen this pattern. Now we're looking here again, exact same pattern. Bayer, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. Let's look at it again here. Bayer, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. So is it, are we supposed to assume, first of all, the data wasn't provided in the article. And then when we look at the data, as we are looking at it right here, are we to assume that this was just random chance that all of these authors who were paid by drug companies happen to have been paid by the exact same pattern of pharmaceutical interests? That's a impressive coincidence. So again, Bayer, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. No wonder they didn't want to publish this. Bayer, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan, Bayer again, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. How is it that all of these authors who disclose payments from drug companies have the exact same pattern of payment for this article? And again, this drug company, Mylan, provided the active treatment as well as the comparator treatment and was present at the meetings for the structure of the study. I've just never seen anything like that. And here we are again. You'll notice I highlighted when, when I saw conflicts of interest here, and I basically had to highlight the whole, whole section here. And again, it's the exact same pattern every time. British Heart Foundation, Bayer four times, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. That's quite impressive. Here we are again. Exact same pattern of funding for each of these authors. Bayer, Solvay, Abbott, Mylan. So I've never seen anything like that. Uh, they don't have much, they don't have much variation or variety in their study designers or their authors. They seem to be cut all from the same cloth.
Bayer Solvay Abbott Mylan. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and it's, that couldn't, I mean, that, that can't happen by chance. I mean, it can't, this can't be random. Bayer Solvay Abbott Mylan. Sorry, I don't mean to skip anyone. Uh, again, Bayer Solvay Abbott Mylan. The exact same funding pattern for each one of these uh, researchers. I've just never seen anything like that in 20, more than 20 years of looking at research. This article is among the most curious I've ever seen. Same pattern previously, same pattern again. So that's impressive. This should have been reported within the printed article at the, on the first page. It wasn't. It should have then been printed at the end. So they provided affiliations on the first page, but they didn't provide any drug affiliations. And then at the end of the article, they provided other affiliations, but again, they intentionally excluded any mention of these drug companies. So returning now back to my slide presentation, let's just look at those four last points. The drug company Mylan paid at least 19 of the authors, oversaw the study design, and supervised its paid consultants at key meetings of this study, provided the treatment and the comparator substance, which was not independently tested, to their convenience, of course, and makes the main competing drug, which is simvastatin. So that's very curious. Now let's look at my very brief list of problems with this article. So we looked at the study design and the population, a randomized trial of 15,000 subjects with diabetes, also obese, also most of them taking a statin drug. This was started in 2005. The use of olive oil as the inactive treatment is absurd and invalidates the placebo-controlled claim of the study, given that olive oil is well known. It's well known now, and it was well known then, to have anti-inflammatory and cardioprotective benefits and has indeed been proposed to be one of the most health-promoting and heart-protecting dietary components available. This was published as early as the 1960s. Certainly by 1986, it was well known, and it was actually reviewed in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2003, which was two years prior to the start of this study, which was then later published in the New England Journal of Medicine 15 years later. This major error alone is sufficient to invalidate the conclusions of this study. So again, we don't have to go any farther than this. We could stop here and say, okay, this research is not worth looking at. But since I went ahead and read it anyway, let's look at the other problems. Problem number two, why were the drug companies invited to the leadership meetings and the design meetings of this study? In more than 20 years of looking at research, I have never seen anything like this. Mylan, Solvay, and Abbott had non-voting representation at meetings. Well, that's nice that they say that they were not voting, but they were supervising their paid consultants, at least 19 of which were paid by these drug companies. Mylan, Solvay, and Abbott had non-voting, so supposedly not. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous by itself. Anyway, I'll try to finish the sentence. Mylan, Solvay, and Abbott had non-voting representation at meetings of the steering committee and provided comments and provided comments regarding the trial design and draft manuscript? That's, that's absolutely insane. While supervising their paid consultants at these meetings. I've never seen anything like that. Problem number three, the drug company that makes the competing drug in this class of cardioprotection, which is the statin drugs, and specifically in this case, simvastatin, the drug company that makes a competing drug was allowed to furnish the products Myelin provided the omega-3 fatty acids and the comparator treatment. Number four, again, 19 of the authors were paid by the drug companies that have vested interest in this study, and the conflicts were not printed in the article. Again, I've never seen that. Actually, I have seen that, but I've never seen it so big and so obvious as to have 19 authors paid by the drug company that has a vested interest in the study, and none of it was mentioned in the published article. Problem number five, the products were not independently tested and the so-called active treatment here, the omega-3 fatty acids, had clinical and biological effects that were inconsistent with what we see in the other studies. So these products should have been tested. Finally, problem number six, 
they tested the omega-3 index in 152 subjects. That's less than 1% of their study population. Uh, this is rather weak, and the results were unusual at baseline. They had a high baseline omega-3 index and a remarkably high increase in the omega-3 index with treatment. So again, I think that those products should have been independently tested. That might give me slightly more faith in this publication in which I have zero faith. Uh, again, let's look at what I had mentioned previously. Now I've reviewed it, but uh, I did point that out here on a different slide. Problem number four, authors were paid by the drug companies and the conflicts were not printed in the article. You can see that the authors were uniformly paid by the same groups, especially Bayer, four times, at least here that we're looking at, Solvay, Abbott, and Mylan, which again had a very strong interest. So here's one example, and then another example, number three, number four, a fifth author paid by the same pattern of drug companies. Very interesting. I've never seen that before. Number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, number 11, number 12, and here we are at number 13, and then number 14, number 15, number 16, number 17, number 18, and number 19. 19 authors paid by the same cluster of drug companies and no disclosure whatsoever within the printed article. That is exceptional. Again, I've reviewed that now at least twice. Problem number two, why were the drug companies invited to the leadership and design meetings of the study? I've never seen that before. They were supervising their paid consultants. So whether they voted or not, uh, they certainly would have provided some pressure. The drug company that makes the competing drug uh, provided the products for this study. That's a bit bizarre as well. And number five and number four and number five, I've already repeated, so I won't go through that again. So moving on now towards the closure of this brief review, what do we do with all of this? So I notice a pattern of bogus research. I've provided video and transcript reviews of that information. You can download that from the internet and you can see the video and download the transcript in various formats from various locations. I'll provide you some links so you can access that rather easily. So we do notice a pattern of bogus research. Again, whether you wanna call that intentional ignorance or the violence of organized forgetting, I'll leave that to you. So what can be done about this? Uh, probably nothing can be done to stop the medical industrial news complex, but people can inform themselves and learn how to think for themselves rather than submit to supposedly authoritative sources which are really nothing more than facades for commercial interests and power structures. Let me go ahead and read that one more time. What can be done to change this situation of bogus research which influences healthcare policy, insurance coverage, medical practice, and patient care, and ultimately, you know, the lives and deaths of millions of people? What can be done to kind of stop or halt or provide some friction to this machine. Probably nothing's going to stop it. So what we can do is try to inform ourselves, learn how to think independently, rather than submit to supposedly authoritative sources. I think that's very important. And that applies throughout life, not simply looking at biomedicine. Because these authoritative sources are really nothing more than facades for commercial interests and power structures. Cancel your subscription to organizations, publications, and companies and people that lie to you. And I encourage you to read real literature, philosophy, and science in order to cultivate a sense of truth. You know, we live in basically a junk culture, and that's true internationally these days. But if we are surrounded by junk, we have to make a decided and clear effort to expose ourselves to clarity. So the solution to junk, in our case, in this case, we're not gonna be able to change the entire culture, but what we can do is create our own intellectual micro environments where we expose ourselves to culture, good writing, good philosophy, good science, good music, things of a, a better standard. And in my opinion, that applies throughout life. So, you know, music influences thought, reading influences thought, videos obviously can influence thought as well.
And I also state here the third major bullet point. If you want to be a good thinker, then you have to give time to developing this skill. You know, I'm, I'm consistently amazed at how people expect or they take for granted the fact that they think they're good thinkers when they've never studied the process. Well, why would that apply to thinking when it doesn't apply to anything else? No one becomes a really great chef or a really great musician without giving some time to practice and study it. Like, I didn't learn Kung Fu, Jiu Jitsu, and Taekwondo by, you know, sitting on the sofa. I had to go to class and learn how to do those things. And, you know, we could all use a million different examples. But thinking is no exception. If I, or if you, or if we collectively want to be good thinkers, we have to study that process. If you want to understand people, you have to study psychology and sociology. If you want to understand music, you have to give some study to the structure of that music. And if you want to understand thinking, you've got to spend some time at least looking at what creates a good argument, what are the logical fallacies that people fall into on a consistent basis, so you can identify those errors in other people's thought and, of course, in your own. In my opinion, the study of psychology and philosophy really helps here a lot because we're grown into, we're, we, we grow up in a culture that has a lot of fallacies. And so if you want to have a good foundation upon which you can then study other subjects like math and science and biomedicine, etc., in my opinion, you're going to be much more effective in those other sciences if you have a strong and clear psychosocial foundation, and that comes from studying philosophy, psychology, sociology, and kind of the history of human thought, basically. So what I did, and I was drawn to do this kind of naturally as a, as a teen, basically, but then in my early 20s, I certainly dove into this with a lot of uh, energy. And, it, and, and I'm not even saying that it was natural to me necessarily or that it was particularly easy. For example, when I first started reading Nietzsche, I didn't understand what he was talking about at all. But I kept forcing myself to read, and eventually, now I can read him without any problem. But don't expect it to be easy. If you're trying to move kind of from a, a common level to a higher level of thought, that transition isn't going to be you know, easy and enjoyable all the time. Many times you'll have to read things that are complicated. You might read the entire chapter, for example, and not really understand it. You have to go back and read it, and then you maybe read it a third time or something like that, and then finally it kind of opens itself to you, or your mind opens itself to the material. Either way, but don't expect that process to be easy. It's not. You're trying to change kind of the structure of your brain when you take on a new task or a new challenge like that, and so of course your brain is going to have to go through an adaptation process, and that's what we call learning, and sometimes we have to work and struggle to do that. So critical and clean thinking is a skill that serves you in every aspect of your life, and the reverse is also true. Like if you're completely ignorant with regard to psychology and sociology, that's probably affecting your relationships and that's probably affecting your thought in other areas as well. So one is not separate from the other. You know, we need to, in my opinion, we need to or we can kind of clarify our emotional lives, psychosocial lives, and then move on to other things such as science. What clinicians should do Clinicians should continue using fish oil supplements generally at a dose of 1,900 milligrams per day if the goal is to optimize the omega-3 index to approximately 10%. And of course, you have to customize that per patient. So a reasonable dose, a little bit less than 2 grams per day of EPA and DHA, and then customize that. Maybe after about 6 months or so, you could test the omega-3 index and see kind of where your patient is. Some patients respond a little more quickly than others. Some patients need higher doses. And of course, if they're obese or if they have malabsorption, then they will need additional treatment for additional time. So thank you very much for your attention during this presentation. This does bring us to a conclusion of this review. Critique of omega-3 fatty acid supplements in diabetes mellitus, the ASCEND study published again in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2018, August. I think I provided you a competent review. I think this study is absolutely worthless and it should have not been published, it should be withdrawn, but of course it will make the major news internationally because that serves the powerful corporate interests of news, advertising, and pharmaceutical drug sales.